Um, welcome to uh, Peer Talks. And uh, we're uh, today, I think the, uh, there's going to be the special uh, talk session between a, uh, the 2025 Expo Osaka Kansai and then the Digital Catapult. Um, so the uh, today's theme is like the power of digital creative. So um, we are honored to have uh, three guests from UK. Uh, the first is uh, Aki Yavian, oh. the technologist in Mars uh, from Digital Catapult. Uh, Emery Savage. Hi, um. Um, commercial product lead in Mars. And Nicolas uh, Fernando. Hello. Uh, program lead, creative policy. And then uh, including a uh, Dai Habata from uh, 2025 uh, Osaka Kansai Exposition. Hi, all. And then me, uh, Seiichi Saito from uh, uh, Panoramatics and then also the PL creative, I mean, PL creator from the uh, uh, Expo Association. So um, today, a, we're, we want to really talk about um, what we've been pursuing, what's the definition of a cyber expo. The cyber expo is a, the kind of idea like which we actually came up like after the uh, COVID and then also after the age of uh, international, I mean, uh, internet, that like how we can actually make the uh, the expo as a global kind of movement. So uh, this is the, still the the cyber expo is a, uh, still the name itself is actually the the tentative. So we have to actually define. So we've been having a series of a talk session with the different uh, people from a different institution and different community. So uh, I think this is going to be the first session that like uh, we were talking like internationally. So um, well, we're going to have a simultaneous uh, the translation uh, trial uh, today. So we are excited about like sharing with those two. So before we jump into like what the digital catapult is doing, um, maybe like uh, we should uh, briefly talk about uh, like experience about what the uh, status of uh, uh, 2025 World Exposition is. So the die, can you actually explain that? Sure, okay. So uh, let me quickly introduce the snapshot of the uh, outline of Expo 2025. So let me share the screen. Just a second, please. Okay. Can okay. I see it? Yep. Okay. So, right. Uh, so, again, uh, hi, all. Uh, my name is Dai Habata from the Japan Association for the 2025 uh, World Exposition. So, uh, in my quick presentation, I'd like to introduce the uh, overview of the Expo 2025 Osaka Kansai Japan. So um, this page shows the total outline of the Expo 2025, also Kansai Japan. And the main theme is designing future society for our lives, which is broken down to three sub-themes, saving lives, empowering lives, connecting lives. And the main concept is people's living level. Uh, we hope the new technologies and systems will be introduced uh, for implementation at the Expo site. Uh, the venue will be Yumeshima, uh, an uh, artificial island at the Osaka city, uh, uh, the Osaka Bay. As seen in the map, uh, the island is already there. And regarding the uh, period, the expo will be uh, held on April 13th, 2025, and will be closed on October 13th, 2025. And the uh, projected number of visits is approximately uh, 28.2 million, including 3.5 million uh, from overseas. So uh, this page shows the organization for the Expo 2025. It's a little bit boring, but uh, it's uh, important. So uh, the government of Japan uh, has their headquarters for the World Expo 2025. The chairman is the prime minister himself and the vice chairman is Minister for the Expo 2025. So we 
the Japan Association for the 2025 World Expo were established January 2019. This is the only official organization to plan, prepare, and manage Expo 2025, working under the direction of the government of Japan. And uh, our association is composed of staff members dispatched from the central and local governments, as well as business community, which includes members coming from different backgrounds like construction, transportation, travel agencies, and trading companies. This is showing the uh, uh, detailed location of the expo venue. Now, uh, three airports, Kansai International Airport, Kobe Airport, Itami Airport, and Shin Osaka Station of Shinkansen uh, uh, provide very efficient and uh, comfortable access from all over the world. So we can travel from the center of Osaka to Yumeshima Island in about 20 to 30 minutes. And this is the last page I want to share. So this is showing the, uh, some images of uh, the uh, 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 theme. So uh, the main theme of the Expo Designing Future Society for Arrives aims of supporting the progress of SDGs set by United Nations. So the target year of SDGs is 2030. So the year 2025 for our Expo is an ideal timing to uh, share and integrate uh, all the solutions developed in all over the world. So it is also an ideal timing to start thinking about what we should do beyond SDGs. So that's it. Thank you. Great. So hopefully uh, a, the audience can understand like what uh, we tried to do toward the uh, Expo 2025. And then well, let me sh uh, talk a bit about like, the status of uh, the uh, Cyber Expo, which is a kind of new idea to install um, to this a uh, Osaka Kansa Expo. So I think okay, we've been uh, still having a big talk about uh well we're gonna have a real venue and also that we're gonna have a virtual venue and then and also we try to have a cyber expo because uh, the one point of the cyber expo which we've been actually uh, talking with a different guest um a like the well we try to open the process of a discussion like how we're going to define the cyber expo a uh, name itself too is that uh for since we have the internet and we have a, a different method to actually make the community not only the physical level but also like the international level uh via internet or social network uh different services so uh well we've been having like the uh almost like the more than 10 uh talks uh public uh mainly with the japanese a uh institutions and then what we came up is that uh, we will, as uh, Dai uh, mentioned, we have a theme, a designing a future. Um, but I think the, you know, the, this expo is going to be the, uh, or we can, you know, have the option to actually they have a function like how we can actually trigger the action um, started from the, the expo. It doesn't need to be the expo, but the um, expo is the, the one chance that uh, the global institution, including um, officially from a different country, the government can actually get together and then think uh, about like how we should act, make the action toward the future um, as a SDGs is the one, the main team. And so uh, we thought the cyber is free platform connecting a real virtual expo. So I think the cyber is like the kind of in between. So I think that you've been the digital part about being doing a lot of like virtual platform too, like, um, and then also like the working together with a, a international institution. So I think we can learn a lot today. And then we thought the cyber expo can uh, connecting things, action, sort, community, philosophy as a platform. And then the platform over I mean, the border of a country and languages. So that's like we are testing out today. Like we try to install like the, the system to um, deal with like the different language at the same time, but the you know people can a uh, communicate without any borders. And um, 
aiming, this is aiming like the, the expo where entire people in the product can participate. So even like for you with a, um, with a really low connection like a GMS um, or smartphone or 5G, like different, you know, the, um, the platform or devices, like you can access to this. I mean, uh, we're uh, ultimate goal um, we're targeting. And then the platform where any scale uh, community can coexist. So even like a small scale or big scale can coexist. And then we're not really thinking about like the making everything by ourselves. Uh, it's more about like the cooperation or co-creation uh, platform like we're actually thinking. So the cyber platform, Expo platform going to be the center, which might be the hub. Um, and then we're going to have like a several original contents, but uh, we are uh, thinking about it'd be great opportunity to actually the connecting the movement like the you guys do um, uh, using the the expo as a platform. And so the well, we're actually thinking about the main theme of the cyber expo going to be the actual full lives and uh, the four different themes: uh, the communication and creation, sharing and matching. Even like the uh, the platform where crowdfunding can be actually joining. So if you have an idea and if you have a solution, but if you have a problem, we can actually connect the dots. And then if you need to fund it, I mean, or maybe like the you know the somebody in the community can actually uh, make the funding uh, for the actions. So uh, that's the idea of uh, Cyber Expo, which is uh, still spongish in a good way. Um, so a the next is the uh, be great to actually uh, get to know about the, what the digital catapult been doing uh, within the UK and also the global level. Uh, Nick, can you explain that? Uh, with the yeah, sure. Thank you so much for for having us. Um, I thought I'd probably start with a quick introduction to myself and then Emily and Aki as well, and then we'll get stuck into the presentation. Um, but hi everybody, I'm Nick Fernando. I'm the policy and research lead at Digital Catapult. Um, I look after a lot of our creative policy, particularly when it comes to government engagement, but also um, when it comes to delivery of research and projects and a lot of our startup engagement, which looks at mapping out what UK startups are doing, what their challenges are, and we figure out how we can help them through that. Um, em, can I hand over to you? Do you want to go next? Yeah, thanks, Nick, and thank you so much for, for having us as well. So I'm Emily Savage, and my role at Digital Catapult is sitting on the commercial team and looking after a lot of the immersive and creative projects that we do. So I'll talk a little bit later about that work that we do with, with business specifically. Um, so really looking at how we can help industry within the UK, but also further afield as well, to adopt advanced digital technology. So great to, uh, great to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. Aki, Yes, hello, my name is Aki Arvinen. I am a colleague of Nix and Emily's and I work in one of the technology layers uh, that we have in the catapult, which is the immersive technologies. And I do uh, research and development type of activities there to help UK businesses. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I'll just share my screen with you. Give me one minute. Yep. Oh, whoops, here we go. Is that looking okay? Yep. Yep, all good, great. So I will get started. So um, before I start, yeah, we've given the intro of who we are. Um, again, thank you so much for having us. Um, Japan are a really important partner for the, for the UK, um, especially because of the expertise you have around areas such as, you know, content creation, AI, robotics, um, manufacturing processes. So I feel you're a company that we definitely look to as a company that kind of inspires us and um, shows us what the advancement of technology can can look like so any collaboration there is uh, definitely um, something we'd, we'd love to explore so um going into um who we are in a brief history of kind of why why we exist um we were established in 2014 and um, digital catapult itself is based in london but we have offices in northern ireland the north of england and in bristol and um, we are part of the catapult network which includes nine other catapults each of which has a focus on a particular area. We are the digital catapult, but there's a catapult that exists called the high value manufacturing one. There's satellite applications, there's um, energy systems. So all of them have a remit, an area that they focus on. 
Um, and the way the way we're funded is um, through an organisation called Innovate UK, which is part of a government government body called um, UK Research and Innovation as well. And um, the reason that it exists is to bridge the divide between research commercialisation for emerging technologies. Um, there's some great work happening in in the UK um, from startups, corporates, um, and academia, but sometimes they're not always talking to each other. So um, we can exist as kind of a neutral body to bring all those people together and get them collaborating and um, you know coming up with solutions together for things um, our main objective is to help exciting startups and companies scale and accelerate the adoption of their technologies and we want to encourage more research and development and innovation in these areas I'll go into some of the technologies that we work on as well so um, as an innovation um, as we're an innovation center and we try to remain neutral so we support the government and the public sector we work with corporates and industry to get them to adopt those technologies and um, we have a very big um, startup and scale-up network over 4,000 companies from the UK um, we work very closely with academia to help commercialize the projects that they work on and as mentioned um, we we have collaborated with the catapult network as well on projects and we want to bring in as much money for some of these growing companies as well to help them scale and grow so um, some of the areas that we look at um, so future networks is one of the technologies so that includes 5g and the internet of things um, immersive technologies um, looking at virtual reality mixed reality augmented reality and haptics artificial intelligence with a focus on machine learning and also distributed ledger technology we're looking at its applications beyond financial where it's tried where it's traditionally kind of been used but we want to see how it can add value um, across a number of different industries um, how we're kind of looking at applying these is um so we've mentioned the advanced digital infrastructures and those four technology areas we mentioned it's coming to a place where they can now converge and work together and um, we're, we're very excited about looking at how those new capabilities can look how can they all complement e each other and be kind of cross-functional um we're looking at digitizing supply chains um so that's looking at um having more management across those more transparency and better efficiencies and then we're looking at virtualized applications uh, which is looking at the human machine interface and how advancements in technologies particularly around immersive can lead to new capabilities and exploring um, technologies such as virtual production as well and then moving on to that, um, how Digital Catapult kind of do what we do. So one of the things we do is we design and build uh, digital facilities. Um, we have a 5G test bed um, in our office. We also have our machine intelligence garage, which looks at um, supplying computational access to startups. We have an immersive lab with the latest and greatest immersive equipment in there. And why that's important to us is to open up access to companies to explore, play, test, demonstrate um, what they're doing. Not all companies have access to this so we thought having something like this really opens it up and let, lets people design um new solutions without having the constraints of not having access to the latest technology um, another thing we do is we design and deliver targeted innovation programs so we have acceleration programs that help startups to scale we provide business support technical support which um some companies they they don't always have access to that either so we can help them really grow um, the other one is we work around um, convening and collaborative research and development. So um, some of the stakeholders I mentioned before, startups, academia, industry, we work together to try and access funding, to come up with new solutions, to commercialize them, and then show the um, all the benefits that advanced technology can provide, maybe sectors, companies, and challenges. Um, a few of the facts about kind of what we do as well. So um, over 12 months, we run about 80 programs and projects and um, there's about 570 small companies that run through these and over the last 12 months uh, those companies have gone on to get over 320 million pounds worth of investment and since we've uh, been around since 2015 and that's been about four billion pounds so um, i'd like to think that's a decent amount of money um so I wanted to also talk about some of the international collaboration we've done. Um, Emily's going to go into another case study as well, but the project that I worked on was working with um, UK India. So that happened in two phases. Um, so 12 months ago, we spoke with the UK government about what we could do to help um, address some challenges around sustainability, net zero, climate change, and um, what in particular, what immersive technology could do in that area. Um, what we suggested was getting together some of the key stakeholders. So that included UK and India. Indian corporates um, and startups to, to talk about what they could do to affect change and come up with a uh, maybe a way to deliver a solution. 
Um, that was phase one. Um, we presented that, put a group together and said, look, these are what we think are the main challenges. And we were given further funding to do a phase two, which was to create the Build UK India Industrial Net Zero program and demonstrator. So what that did was that allowed startups to get £45,000 worth of funding to, to develop a prototype or a solution to demonstrate in March. Um, it's been a very exciting program to work on. It's currently running. It's been a collaboration between um, UKRI, um, the UK government, um, some Indian corporates, and a number of UK startups who are applying to uh, gain access to that funding. But um, what we're excited to do is to see over the next kind of six months, what can we create um, and how we can really affect change, particularly in a topic such as net zero and climate change and sustainability, which is, is a pressing issue for everyone right now. And we'd like to think people are actively looking for solutions in this area. So um, we're really excited to how that's going to kind of uh, turn out. We have the demonstrator for it in March uh, 2022 next year and um we'll have um solutions hopefully for people to touch and play with and um see what value they can add um we're going to be going to have a presence at cop 26 as well um in november so we're hoping to we're hoping to have some announcements there around how this program is going but um we'd love to do something like this with uh, with with japan as well and um, to explore um what challenges are most pressing in industry yeah you know net zero sustainability creative whatever it is and looking at how really exciting startups can show you what they do and and work together because we find that corporates aren't always the the best at speaking to to other startups so maybe we can help bridge that gap um that's my section done um i'm going to pass over to aki to talk about uh, creative innovation with immersive technologies yeah Thanks. one comment about like well, your challenges uh between the uk and india which is like well, i think you are right now at the page two that's exactly what the Cyber Expo should do. So I think, you know, we can definitely, I mean, personally, like, well, we can definitely corroborate with like something like maybe like UK, India, Japan, and then we well, using an Expo platform, like you can actually engage with like the different countries, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's amazing. We'd, we'd love that, yeah, for sure. Yep, awesome. so right. Akisam, yep, do you wanna present? Okay, yes, please. Uh, yep. Right. So I'll just briefly set the scene before Emily goes into a bit more detail regarding one specific uh, case study. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, one of the key things uh, that we do is we run different programs and projects uh, with startups, but also take part in, as Nick mentioned, the collaborative research and uh, development programs. and. Uh, one of the major uh, pro projects that we've been involved with uh, for the last few years is, is called Audience of the Future. It's a UKRI funded project. And uh, our role has been to sort of support the demonstrators who have been building quite uh, ambitious project in that. But as an, another output from the project that we've recently been running and launching uh, is a project called Immersive Arcade. And this is basically and uh, an exhibition space that has sort of documenting catalogued the best of British virtual reality in the creative space for the last few years. So what we did in cooperation with the Museum of Other Realities, which is a, a VR museum out there, which has uh, housed many sort of festivals, for instance, from Cannes. And at the moment, there's a Vancouver International Film Festival has works uh, exhibited in Museum of Other Realities. So we partnered with them and commissioned three volumes of a work from a number of uh, previous VR creators. So in total at the moment, in the retrospective where all this work is exhibited, there's 12 pieces of uh, British VR in the creative space being exhibited. And actually during the latter part of the year, we've been also touring around the UK to make sure that also people who don't necessarily have VR headsets at home, students and, and, and so on and so forth, uh, have access and have been able to enjoy uh, this quite unique experience. And on a broader scale, the other program that I want to mention is Creative XR, which has been now running uh, already a few years and has produced three cohorts of uh, a number of companies uh, that have prototyped and explored you know, really like push the envelope in the immersive art space. And this program has been run with in cooperation with Arts Council England. 
And basically in the program, uh, we give uh, 20 or so teams uh, a small amount of money to spend 12 weeks prototyping their idea. And then at the end of the program, we organize a showcase where the teams exhibit and, and present their work to commissioners, investors, and interest parties. And, and we've had quite a few successes uh, going from that early prototype to actual uh, products. So next, next slide, please. So here's just an example so that you get a feel of uh, what do these projects actually mean. So, so the image on the left that says Vestige, that's from a, one specific space within the Museum of the Realities and within the immersive arcade. And you may see that there are avatars in the in the space. So, so the museum is very much a social space as well. And, and actually this shot is from a, one, of, one of the opening nights of one specific volume. And uh, the other uh, picture here is a recent success uh, originally originating from Creative XR, so Goliath, which is a VR piece having to do with important topics, having to do with uh, mental health and so forth has, has been recently recognized uh, in international festivals uh, with, to create acclaim. So I wanted to give you those couple of examples what comes typically out of from these kinds of projects. Next slide. So beyond the specifically creative uh, stuff, we do also then have programs that try to accelerate the immersive business in more general fashion. So Augmentor is one of those where we basically try to support and catapult, so to speak, immersive companies to the next level. And the, the focus with this program, this accelerator in the past couple of years has been business to business. So, so that's, that's just an example where we facilitate uh, programs and support where it doesn't need to be confined to the creative space. And then because we at the catapult, as also Nick was outlining, we, we run different kinds of activities. We have a new initiative called uh, Future Scope, which is kind of bringing all these different acceleration programs under the same umbrella and especially tries to get at the cross technology aspect so that we are starting to see how the promise of, for instance, the immersive technologies is very much based on whether they can leverage AI or 5G or Internet of Things to create something better, like more than the sum of their parts. And Future Scope is a new initiative is trying to tackle that. Next slide. And this is my final one before I hand it over to Emily. I just want to underline the fact that all these programs and projects benefit from the national network that we have so that we don't just do things in London and we don't just do immersive. We do those other technology layers that Nick also mentioned. And we have, for instance, 5G test beds around the UK. We have IoT frameworks and, and things like that, and also universal partnerships. So all the companies and all the projects that we run benefit from these opportunities to sort of spread our network and test things uh, across the UK. And with that, I'll hand it over to Emily. Brilliant, thank you, Aki. All right, so I'm just gonna talk um, for a little bit to talk more about the kinds of work that we do with business. So as already discussed, we have um, huge amounts of activities that Digital Catapult undertake with government and with the startups. But our third remit is really to work with industry to help them adopt advanced digital technology. So, uh, sorry, next slide, please. So this is our industry mission, which is supporting business to shape and develop industry ready technology solutions. And the way that we do that is through um, a unique capacity really that we have at Digital Catapult. Um, first and foremost, and probably most, one of the most valuable things is of course the people that we have. So we have a huge amount of technologists that specialize in all of the areas that Nick mentioned at the beginning. So um, XR or immersive, artificial intelligence, 5G, Internet of Things. Um, and so all of these teams are either from academic backgrounds or from industry backgrounds and understand in depth those technologies. On top of that, we then have our innovation and design led team. So they're there to really unpick the problems, to look at how to design the solutions in the first place and to give the level of rigor that's needed to make sure that any company is going down the right route when they're looking at technology innovation. 
Um, the, the other you know, huge value we have is our startup network. So because of these accelerator programs, like, like the ones that Aki mentioned, such as Creative XR and, uh, uh, and, and Augmental, um, we have this um, incredible roster of talent and we try to pull that together to work on industry projects so that industry are not such a long way away from the uh, original talent and uh, new ideas that we see coming up at grassroots. Um, we then have all this experience of running these types of projects, which in itself uh, is never an easy feat. Uh, but you know how to deliver innovation projects, how to develop accelerators. And finally, we have those facilities that Nick mentioned, um, and they include things like 5G test beds and immersive labs, but places that are, are real physical places where people can get their hands on um, technology and networks that are obviously hard to come by otherwise. Uh, so next slide, please. So the type of innovation journey that we think about um, when we're working with big business is to move um, all the way in a handheld type manner from their initial exploration right the way through to them actually scaling up a new product or service. So that means you're going through several phases and some companies are further along that journey when they come to us, others right at the beginning. Um, so um, I, I won't explain all of the, the bits on this slide and hopefully you can have a look through in your own time. Um, but it, it means that it's worked in a phased approach and the whole point is that we're trying to reduce that risk of someone coming in, not really understanding where um, technology might have an application um, with the potential risk of them scaling in the wrong direction. And if you break it down into these kinds of steps and have the you know, real ideation, design, experimentation that goes on before that with things like prototype building and proof of concept, then you can you know, test out the various paths, work out what works and what doesn't work and then scale once you're on the right track. So I'm gonna talk now um, just quickly about uh, a client that we worked with recently um, that was a non-UK company. Um, they are the Munch Museum, uh, who you may well know, know of. They, it is a museum based in Oslo in Norway um, that represents all of the work of Edvard Munch, who of course is the famous artist that did this wonderful picture, Scream. Um, it is one of the largest museums of a single artist's collections. And they came to us, um, again, having heard about the existence of digital catapult, which didn't exist um, in the same kind of context in Norway. And they came to us because as a museum, they wanted to launch a new type of product. They wanted to experiment and look at developing an immersive augmented reality app for their customers, uh, for a very specific type of customer, school children. Um, but they did not really know where to start because they were very used to, as a museum, you know, they're expert at putting together physical exhibitions, putting together even um, linear media, but not so much 3D. So they came to us with these kind of four areas. They wanted to launch this new app. They wanted to better understand how they even described that challenge. You know, how, how would they even put the brief out there to overall decrease that risk of putting out the wrong brief? And then, of course, to try and find some new partners that they could work with longer term to deliver this kind of work. So we went away and thought about how we might be able to help them. Um, if we just go to the next slide, please. And this is what we came back uh, as a, a project uh, in order to tackle their challenge. So we said, look, we've got these things that we think are really gonna offer a lot of value. We've got this ecosystem of immersive startups in the UK and the UK really does uh, have this kind of huge wealth that doesn't exist in every other country uh, of, of talent, of people that understand 3D design, they understand augmented reality and they understand how to put it across in a, in a user-friendly way. We also said we've got this great technology team that really understand uh, immersive or XR, it often gets called, design specialism. And actually, you've got one of those experts on this call today. Aki uh, is one of our lead design specialists when it comes to immersive. And finally, we said we have an understanding of how to deliver these kinds of projects within the creative sector. And that's really important because, as we know, every industry works quite differently with how they undertake product management. And working within a creative environment, a museum in itself is quite a, a specialist type of operation. So um, if we just go to the next slide, this is how we went through a process with the Munch Museum. 
we worked with them initially to, to really scope out what the challenge was, to really understand it, to kind of interrogate it from all angles and make sure that um, the challenge that they wanted to put out there to uh, the startups was the correct one. And then we did exactly that. We worked and we put out an open call to the UK startups and said, who's got um, a really great idea as to how we could meet this uh, customer experience challenge that the museum has? Um, and with that, we had said there would be a certain amount of funding to develop a prototype, which we would assist with as well. So then we had a pitch day and we chose the winners. And if we go to the next slide, you can see this was our, our winning SME, who are a company in the UK called Arcade. Um, and they um, worked brilliantly, both from pitch all the way through to development. So we came together then as a three, as a three company partnership. It was ourselves, it was the Munch Museum, and it was this very talented um, creative design agency called Arcade. And by having that trio, you de-risk the whole thing for the Munch Museum, who felt like they were taking their first baby steps. And the way we de-risk that, if we just go to the next slide, is that even though Arcade had come up with this brilliant idea, we wanted to make sure that we were putting it through its paces to ensure that the development of this new idea, this new, new mobile product, effectively, it's a new augmented reality mobile product, was actually designed and developed in the right way. So Aki worked with both the museum and the startup to go through this five stage process where you're really looking at empathizing with the users, really defining exactly what was needed from the feedback with users, ideating, prototyping, testing, and then going back a few stages if you need to ideate again, prototype again. So we, we went through this process over several months and it meant that what came out the other end was a very well tested, um, incredibly uh, highly scoped uh, prototype for the museum to properly start engaging and rigorously testing, is this going to drive new consumer interaction from uh, a school children audience was the target client in, in this case. So if we just go to the next slide, and the, just a couple more here. So, you know, obviously we're doing this partly through the pandemic. So there was an awful lot of remote brainstorming and workshops and design uh, activities that were happening. And um, it worked really, really well, actually. You, you know, we're testing out new methodologies from our side. And more than anything, we were introducing the museum to these very new digital design best practices. And what it resulted in, if we just go to the final slide, was um, a brand new prototype that enabled um, school children to really uh, engage in this new idea. And I haven't got into the creative concept too much, but um, I can send out more information on that. But the whole idea was encouraging children to be creative, be adventurous, and um, come up with artistic concepts uh, in their environment through augmented reality. Um, and ultimately to do as Monk the artist did, which was not to be fearful of things being imperfect. So it was trying to encourage children to embrace imperfection and develop beautiful uh, new artistic concepts um, in their own space around them. And ultimately therefore engage them in the mentality and ideology of Monk and hopefully encourage them to go to the museum um, at a later date. So just to kind of wrap up in terms of evaluating on the next slide, um, what, we, what we really brought in terms of the value to Monk. As we say, we facilitated a better way for them to work with creative agencies, which is a scary concept if you haven't done it before. Um, we upskilled them in, in how to actually conduct um, very robust uh, immersive or XR user research. So how do you test a product, an immersive product? What are you looking for? What are the, the metrics? We also then introduced um, a whole bunch of new workshop formats and methodologies so that they can carry on and do innovation on their own um, without that handholding uh, next time round. And specifically looking at mobile as a service, product development and, and how to drive that in a, in a data driven manner. And ultimately we feel we've helped them to become good clients when they are working with digital and creative agencies in the future. So the last two slides, I'm just going to mention more broadly, you know, how is it that Digital Catapult likes to work with organizations? What, what kinds of things do we actually um, enjoy tackling uh, with, with companies? So just on that final slide, 
So these are the broad stroke areas. So we love to help companies design and build prototypes or proof of concepts. Um, we really like, uh, you know, allowing companies to go on that journey of working constructively with startups, predominantly UK startups, um, but equally we sometimes engage a, a wider field as well, particularly when we do uh, joint uh, collaborations with other countries. We, of course, love to help educate about advanced digital technology, so um, allowing companies to understand the potential, what it can bring. Um, and then involving other organizations in collaborative research and development projects. So that is when multiple companies come together to take advantage of grants, research grants that might come up um, for a certain area. And then finally, um, we have even gone as far as helping uh, businesses and organizations to design and build their own innovation facilities. So um, whether that's 5G test beds or immersive labs, um, we again will help them with the design and the concept work of what that means and how to actually uh, engage. So I'll wrap up uh, my little section there. I'm going to hand um, back over now. I think uh, I'm already saying initially back to Aki. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, before going to Aki, I think Aki going to talk about like a, a little collaboration uh, case studies and all that, and a potential collaboration. But I think that's like uh, the what the Emily explain to us is amazing like in terms of like you know how the creative sector is actually helping the industry to actually make move forward and then just one question like what so the, in terms of like the, well, we have a pandemic but the all the procedure didn't need to stop right the procedures of, of trying to work together you mean mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely tough. Um, you know, we originally started with the Munk Museum um, when the world was normal. And then suddenly, uh, as we kicked off, um, everything changed. So, you know, there was a whole bunch of workshops that we'd planned to either fly to Oslo or vice versa. Um, and they everything had to be kind of restructured. So, um, I, I, you know, like every organisation, I think we've become um, far more effective as to how to deliver really good um you know brainstorming and innovation sessions uh over over zoom calls and, and in a more virtual environment and aki um certainly is the master of of using lots of the digital um wow. uh, sticky note boards and things like that to to help with these exercises wow that's amazing so maybe i can uh i can explain a bit more about that yeah yeah maybe going forward but uh at this point uh i think in the interest of time, I'll uh, continue with the next section. Yeah, sure, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So what we also wanted to do here, because as Kalak invited by our hosts to touch on uh, how we from the UK perspective, and I guess more broadly from the Western perspective, we see what could be fruitful uh, for the Cyber Expo to, to you know, bring to the surface. And, and, and it really touched on also then that what do we see as the key future developments in this creative space, the technologies and, and so on and so forth. So uh, next slide, please. So when we think about the future, often like the first thing that comes to mind of the world, first word that might, might come to mind is, is, is trends. And, and, and there's lots of energy and time being spent on spotting trends and identifying them. But I would want to I emphasize this fact that actually trends are something that is already happening. They are already here. And so, so if you are content on in the identifying trends, you are already talking about the present and not really the future. But the interesting thing about trends is that they do have a direction always. They are going somewhere from today to, to the future. And then there are a number of forces that influence and impact that direction. So actually that's, I think, something that we'd like to see the cyber X so to think that, okay, not just 2025 and what is trend now, but okay, what is, you know, if we talk about designing the future society of our lives, what is, uh, what it's, it's gonna be in 2030 or even 2035. So uh, next slide, please. So therefore uh, we think that uh, we should, uh, or, or we are here encouraging the CyberX to, to surface some of the sort of fringe stuff that is happening on the sort of periphery that is not yet sort of identified as a trend, but is the trend of 
five to ten years from Osaka 2025. But also, as Nick said in the very beginning, uh, we in the in the West we do look to Japan to sort of show the way or at least create something really fascinating and interesting. Whether it's like uh, the fascination with Japanese history or the Japanese uh, popular culture, or then something having to do with, for instance, processes like the Toyota production system, which basically is the is the fundament for any lean process out there that that uh, all kinds of businesses are adopting. So while doing that, and, and while putting up the Cyber Expo, we want to encourage you not to sacrifice the unique Japanese perspective that we've been inspired in the past. Next slide. And so when we talk about future, I wanted to touch quickly on a few themes that we find interesting at the moment and which are kind of emerging and might be a bigger thing in, in the next five to 10 years. So I will touch a bit more on the term metaverse, which I don't necessarily personally particularly like, but it's just a word that at this moment is a very hot topic. It's a buzzword and it seems to attract investment. So I think we have to address it to an extent. But the other things that we are looking at, for instance, is the so-called augmented reality cloud. So that this idea of a planet scale augmented reality network that would enable sort of persistent, very location specific augmented reality content, uh, you know, accessible with, with uh, uh, very sort of uh, low end devices even. And 5G is a big part of that, for instance. But then going a bit to another uh, direction, for instance, virtual humans. And so this ties to something that we know from different services and games and so on as avatars, but actually going a few steps forward beyond that to marrying artificial intelligence and aspects of our cognition as human beings and how to make that into a digital virtual format to help uh, in different areas of, of, of business, uh, including medical applications, but certainly many creative uh, applications out there. Then multi-sensory technologies. Now, for instance, when we talk about immersive technology, they are mainly at the moment focusing uh, in our sight uh, and in our, for, on our hearing. So two different senses, to, to a lesser extent haptics, our sense of touch. But we do have also other senses. We have all the senses having to do with our moving around our balance, like so-called vestibular stuff, but also, for instance, smell. And currently in the R&D laboratories of the world, there are interesting technologies that are trying to solve that. Well, how could we distribute smell to homes in, in a similar fashion as we distribute sights and sounds nowadays? And so I, I do believe this is an area that will uh, become more commonplace uh, in the next 10 years or so. And, and that would, would be something interesting to maybe look at in collaboration between UK and Japan. And finally, in a similar fashion, brain computer interfaces are really like the next step in human computer interaction. And so how could we control something basically with our minds? Uh, that's another sort of bubbling under a theme where there's interesting research and development going on around the world and how could all that be brought together in an interesting way? Uh, that's the question. Now, I will uh, touch upon the metaverse going forward uh, a bit more detail. So next slide, please. So I wanted to use the metaverse as a kind of discussion starter here, that could there be something uh, within that big challenge of creating like I will explain in a minute what I mean by open metaverse. Uh, could UK and Japan play somehow a part in that? So let's go to the next slide. So there's lots of good thinking around the metaverse. There's also lots of sort of empty promises at the moment and, and inflation with the term. But uh, Matthew Ball is an investor from the US and I think he's the one of the best thinkers around this topic. And he has attempted at a definition of a metaverse. So you might have heard the term in connection with different online games. Uh, in the West, it's mostly Fortnite and Roblox that get mentioned. And, and the idea there is that these uh, services are sort of starting to expand from the sort of their typical function, like providing gameplay and providing space for play into housing 
uh, concerts, for instance, for international stars, and therefore sort of expanding their repertoire of what what motivates people to come to these virtual spaces. So with that in mind, uh, Matthew Bolis has tried at this definition, which goes, the metaverse is an expensive network of persistent, real-time rendered 3D worlds and simulations that support continuity of identity objects, data, and entitlements, and can be experienced synchronously by an effectively unlimited number of users, each with an individual sense of presence. Now, this definition packs tons of technology and challenges. So let's go to the next slide. So the key thing here is that uh, even if we are seeing these sort of weak signals of the metaverse uh, coming, uh, emerging, for instance, Roblox housing concerts and, and, and so on and so forth, there's still lots of work to be done. Uh, you can, even if within Roblox as a service, you can use your same identity and avatar across games, across its sort of a walled garden of services. You can't take your Roblox avatar to Fortnite or to an Asian online uh, game service, for instance, or an entertainment service or a public service. And, and therefore, Matthew Ball has used this sort of a framework for the metaverse core enablers that you see here. So it's not just about that 3D content. It's not just about the networking, the platform. There's all kinds of stuff having to do with payment and delivering the content over the network and stuff like that, which no single company or nation can solve by themselves. And therefore, if we go to the next slide, so the, so the, the meta, which meta means like bring something together to a larger whole, that's like the biggest thing, biggest challenge really. And therefore in a similar fashion, when the electricity network was built, there was no one company that could do it by themselves. They required lots of different innovation in different areas to make that happen. And then we are in a similar situation with metaverse though. So you might be the CEO of the world's most popular social network, but you can't build an, at least an open metaverse by yourself. You need collaboration and you need innovations in a wide variety of sectors that you are not, that are part of not your core business. Or you might be an academic who's making an innovation in file format compatibility, but that doesn't allow you to build the uh, metaverse by yourself again. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So this brings us to the idea that we need to think about the open metaverse uh, for this to make really any meaningful sense, the whole world. So my idea is this, that there is no meta in the metaverse without interoperability. So while all these different verses and horizons and lands are emerging as services out there, they tend to be walled gardens built by one company and their revenue models also tend to be built around uh, this very profitable, but slightly questionable attention economy that social media or free to play games, uh, for instance, the mobile space have made very popular. But for instance, I wanted to link to this uh, recent post and interview with Tim Sweeney, who is the CEO of uh, Epic Games. He's one of the rare sort of thought leaders in this space that has been sort of open to this idea and, and acknowledged the challenge of the open metaverse. And, and so I recommend following and reading about his thoughts. But so the question remains that is there an space is there an uh, opportunity for like an alternative open metaverse and that could be something if we go to the next slide that maybe uk and japan could try to figure out uh, at least part of it together and and the, one of the reasons is that i still do think that the metaverse as an idea is interesting because uh the reason that it has now gained all this traction and, 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 and this sort of password status is that when these things happen in services like Fortnite or Roblox, as Matthew Ball has already has also put it, we can kind of like feel it beginning. There's some something there that we can see a weak signal of. And, and therefore, it wouldn't be a foolish investment in trying to take this open metaphors philosophy and then start to think about it, okay, how could uh, UK and Japanese companies solve at least a part of that equation together? 
So I think that was my final thing that I wanted to say. Wow. Well, thanks for the DV great presentation. I think the, you have a specific idea like how we can actually corroborate. And then, yeah, like, well, I started realizing that, like, the, what's the potential of uh, Expo is, I mean, in terms of, like, corroborating or cooperating. And then also, we have to have the aspect of uh, economy and the funding, too. Um, otherwise, the, the well, I start understanding deeply about, like, the uh, what the Emory mentioned about, um, innovation journey, like how you actually make the process to actually distill and then like the, make the sharpen the focus. And then like, you know, it's not just like the, the, the hackathon or, you know, the kind of like the quick idea, but it's like, well, it have to be delivered to the society and having a feedback and then start, I mean, you know, they have to be like the one, the UTD uh, which is like keep developing to the next phase. I mean, as a platform. Yeah, Dai, do you have any uh, opinion or amaze or any comments about the digital, what the digital yeah, platform have been doing? Definitely, and that was huge. So yeah, uh, thank you very much for introducing all the fascinating activities and their technologies or their, yeah, ideas. So I was personally, also impressed because I was in charge of Japan's startups about policy in my previous positions. So yeah, I, and uh, I also studied at the design school in the US until last year and did service design projects using digital technologies. So I felt very close to your activities. And uh, I also appreciate Aki's words about uh, without sacrificing their unique Japanese uh, perspectives. Yeah, yeah, I respect the word. So. Uh, personally, uh, from the perspective of the concept of PLL, People's Living Global, I'd like to I'd like the expo to be a kind of testing ground, testing bed for companies, startups, and creators from all over the world. And I believe that the Cyber Expo is one of the key pieces to make this happen, uh, while demonstrating Japanese uh, Japan's uniqueness. So. I'd like to create various uh, collaborations to make this happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that what the Dai mentioned about the, the concept of a people's living lab, which is actually the, the business model concept of the entire Expo 2025. And mm -hmm. then living lab um, should be open to everyone. And well, I was always questioning about like, well, when I was working on, um, the Milan Expo, well, there is actually the, like a UK pavilion and Japanese pavilion. Yeah. Those are like, you know, but it doesn't need to corroborate each other. Yeah, so uh, I think it, the, the Expo is gonna be like the one, the, the platform to corroborate uh, mm -hmm. in a different sector, including the creative design. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point that, yeah, lots of the other expos, every country will come and represent themselves, but. I think it is about predetermining, as you say, a framework for for that collaboration before before the actual event. Um, so you can almost build up to then showing off some of the kind of output of collaborative activity at the at the expo itself. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we have leading intense session. Uh, we have like a one hour, a minute to go, so yeah. we have to close. <laughs> Uh, sadly, but I think what we promise, like, we're going to have the second session with you guys to discuss more about, like, uh, you know, the crisp idea, like how we can corroborate, because I think we can learn a lot. Um, we can work a lot uh, together to actually um, make the expo actually be the worst, um, you know, uh, functioning to the global level. Yep. So, well, thank you very much. Uh, we have Nick, Emily, Aki from a Digital Catapult. Uh, well, today was like the special session of a few talks, but we promised we're going to have this uh, next version. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for Thanks. having us. Thank you. Thank you so much.